Amen. Thank you, uh, Mary Makers, for blessing. Um, I tell you, Mary Makers, they meet every Tuesday morning. They usually get here around 9.30, 9.45, and they'll uh, sing, and then they have time of fellowship, and Mark always leads a Bible study. But they, they're kind of a stumbling block for me, and I'll tell you why. Because I've been trying to push away from the sweets. But just about every Tuesday, I'll be in my office, and I know they're up there eating. And, and one of them will come down, and they'll have a piece of cake. You want a piece of cake? And it'll, be, it'll be a chocolate or a, one of those big cinnamon rolls or something. And, and I, you know, I don't want to offend them, so i got to eat it, you know? So, but uh, thank you so much, Mary Makers. That was, a, uh, that was a blessing. All right, this morning, if you brought your Bibles, yes, ma'am? I heard my voice. Oh, okay. Thank you, Miss Betty. Yes, amen. All right. Okay. Uh, if you brought your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. We are returning to where we left off last week. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. We're going to look again at uh, verses 29 through 36. So if you will, in honor of God's Word today, would you please stand? Last week we were focusing in on verses 29 through 32, and so today we're going to conclude with verses 33 through 36. The Bible says, No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see it. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp, when its rays give you light. Well, let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for the time of worship we've had. We thank you for the merrymakers and their faithfulness to this church. Lord, just as the song that we just sang, Lord, we thank you that you went all the way went all the way to the cross, and you suffered on our behalf. It's because of what you did for us on the cross that we have reason to sing today. We can stand today knowing that we are redeemed, knowing that every single one of our sins are forgiven through your grace, through your sacrifice on the cross. And so, Lord, we come today as people wanting to hear from your word. Lord, may our eyes be open today so that we can receive the revelation of Your Word so that it can illumine every area of our life. Lord, we love You, we thank You, and we praise You, and we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. All right, thank you. You may be seated. I wanted to, to mention we had a great time this morning. We had joint Sunday school here in the worship center, and uh, Brother Mike, our Sunday school director, did an awesome job leading us. And I tell you, I'm excited about all that God is doing here at First Baptist Church and all that He has in store for us and how He's going to use Sunday school to reach people and to minister uh, to people with the gospel. Uh, We had a need that's been met. Uh, We had a a need in one of our preschool classes, a three- and four-year-old class, and uh, the Lord has risen up. Tommy and Sherry Bell, they're going to begin teaching that class beginning in March, and so pray for them. And so some great things are happening. I'm excited to see that uh, God is at work in our Midst. All right, so here we are in the Gospel of Luke. I entitled this message, Open Your Eyes. There's two things, I believe, as we look at this text, the Lord wants our eyes to be open to this morning. The first one we saw last week, and that was in verses 29 through 32, and that is this. The Lord wants our eyes to be open to the sign that confirms saving faith. Now, just as a, a brief synopsis of what we talked about last week, we're there. And uh, we saw that the crowds had come to Jesus, and uh, Jesus saw their motives. They were not coming to worship Jesus as the Son of God. They were not coming to learn from Jesus, but in actuality, they came wanting to test Jesus. They came demanding a sign. They said, we want a sign. And in essence, ultimately what they were saying was, is we don't believe because it's your fault. You have not given us enough to prove that you truly are who you claim to be. So we are demanding a sign. 
And of course, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, called them out, called them on the carpet. He said, you are an evil generation. He knew their hearts were hardened. They were self-righteous. And uh, the amazing thing is, is if we had been there on that day, we would have looked at many of them and said, you know, they, they're, they're good folks, religious folks, very moral people, would make great church members. But the problem was is that they were trusting in their religion that was absent of the Savior, and they were trusting in their morality for their standing before the Lord. As I said last week, religion and morality can be a very dangerous thing. Because you can be very religious and very moral and have a life that is absent of Jesus Christ, and you think that because you're religious and because you're moral, that that'll be good enough. And so it's blinding because it blinds our eyes to our ultimate need. Our ultimate need is not religion. Our ultimate need is not morality. Our ultimate need is forgiveness. And the only way we'll experience forgiveness is if, we're come, if we come to that place where we recognize that we are sinners before a holy God and that one day we will stand before Him. And the only way we can be ready for that day is if we run to Jesus and we throw ourselves upon His mercy and grace and beg for His mercy and forgiveness. And so Jesus says, I'm going to give you a sign. I will give you the sign of Jonah. That's the only sign that I'm going to give you, and that is the ultimate of all signs. And for believers, that is the resurrection. That was the ultimate sign that Jesus provided that proved that He truly was God when He rose from the grave. And for us as believers, the resurrection affirms our faith. It affirms that we are no longer in our sins because Jesus Christ overcame sin on the cross and through the resurrection. It affirms that our greatest enemy, death itself, has been defeated. Jesus Christ, by coming forth out of the grave, has overcome death. So this morning, you do not have to live your life in fear of death. I know a lot of people that, that the thought of death, the very thought of death, brings just an overwhelming sense of of fear. But you know what? As, as Christ followers, because we know Jesus Christ rose from the grave, He overcame He overcame death for us, so we don't have to fear death. So, so the resurrection is the sign that affirms our faith as believers. Well, today we want to move to the, to the second point. This is the second thing that the Lord wants our eyes to be open to today. And that is this, it comes in verses 33 through 36. He wants us to see the sin that explains damning faith. The sin that explains damning faith. The faith that many in Jesus' day, many of the religious elite, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, again, very religious But they had a damning faith. A faith that would ultimately send them to hell. And in these verses, Jesus teaches us about the sin that explains damning faith. So let's just look at this for a few moments in detail. Notice in verse 33, we see the light. The light. He says, No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a lamp but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Now, this is in connection to what just happened prior when the the religious leaders, the, the multitudes, were demanding a sign from Jesus. He says, no one, it just doesn't even make sense to take a lamp a light, and light it, and then cover it. Now, Jesus used this illustration prior to this. We, we talked about this several weeks ago. And in that illustration, the light, the lamp, represents us as believers. The light of Jesus should be flowing through us. We should live such a light, 
a life that the light of Jesus radiates into the world. But now in this illustration, the lamp or the light is representative of Jesus Christ. Now, in order to understand what Jesus was saying here, we have to get back into Jesus' time. And uh, in those days, they didn't have Georgia Power. They didn't have the EMC. They didn't have electricity. So what you would do is you would typically have in, in the average home in Jesus' day, it would just typically be one big room, and uh, they would have a lamp stand, and they would take a lamp, they would light it, and they would put it on that lamp stand, and, and they would use that lamp to illumine the entire room. Jesus says, you know that when you go to the house and you light the lamp, you're not going to do anything to cover the light because you want that light to be able to radiate through the room. So you're not going to purposely cover the light. Jesus here is saying, I am that light. He said in John chapter 8, verse 12, He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows Me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then in John chapter 1, verse 9, speaking of Jesus, it says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So Jesus says here, I am the light, and I have, done, I have done nothing to purposely hide my light from radiating out to everyone. He says, my message has been given to everyone for all to hear. He says, my message has been plentiful. And by this point in Jesus' life, he had, he had spoken openly many times about who He was. The Son of God. So his, his light had been plentiful and it had been very public. You know, Jesus didn't just come and, and reveal himself just to a group of 12 individuals. He revealed himself to many. So, so he's saying, I'm like that lamp. I haven't done anything to, to hide who I am. He says it's been, it's been plentiful. It's been public. And, and, and ultimately, the message of Jesus was to shed light on God, the fact that Jesus was fully man and fully God. He, he came His message, the message of Jesus. It shed light not only on God, but it shed light on ourselves, on the people of the day. He helped them to recognize that they had a problem. Their problem was their heart. They needed a new heart. Therefore, they needed somebody that could save them from their sins. And He showed them that He was the one who would save them from their greatest problem, and that was their wicked hearts. And so it was through His message, through the light of His message, that pointed them to the reality that one day as sinners, they would stand in judgment before God, but that they could stand in judgment confidently knowing that they had been forgiven through repentance. So he says, I am the light. I'm the light. I've been made, I have been made fully known. I haven't purposely uh, you know, hidden, my, hidden my light. It's, it's been freely given to all. So Jesus is the light. So we see the light in verse 33. Then in verse 34, let's look at the lamp. The lamp. He says in verse 34, Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Okay? So we had the light in verse 33. Now we have the lamp. The lamp. And the lamp is representative or is represented by our eyes. Our spiritual eyes like a lamp delivers light. A lamp, the purpose of a, of a lamp is to disperse light. And so Jesus says here that you, you have a lamp, that is your eyes. And your eyes are either, a, are either good or they're bad. If they are good, they're, they, they, they're open to receive the light of Jesus. Therefore, the whole body you have spiritual eyes that, 
that are open to, to the truth of God's Word, the light of Jesus flows into your life and it, it consumes every area of your life. Now, I think what's interesting is, is when I was studying this, I was reminded that we don't have the light within ourselves. The light must come from outside. He is the light. And we must open our eyes so that our, our inside will receive His light. He says, if, you, if your eyes are good, then, then the truth, my message that I have been speaking to you, you will openly receive it, and it will flow into your life, and it will illumine every area of your, of your life. You're, you're going to be receptive to truth. But if your eyes are bad, they're clouded by sin, then it will prevent my truth from coming into your life. Therefore, the inside will be filled with darkness. And this was the problem with many in that day. They had bad eyes. And their eyes were, were, were bad. Therefore, the, the truth, the message, the, the light of the message that Jesus preached wasn't allowed to come inside of them. Therefore, they were filled with darkness. Now, what are those things? What are those things that can cause our eyes to be bad? Well, let's sum it up in, in, in three, three major things that can, that can prevent our eyes from receiving truth. Number one is sin. Sin. That is the problem. That was the problem with the religious leaders of the day. Their hearts were hardened by sin. It was the sin of unbelief. They refused to receive the truth about who Jesus Christ was because their hearts were full of sin. Secondly, the second thing that can blind our eyes is Satan. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 speaks of, of our eyes being blinded by Satan. And there's another source. There's one final, one final thing that can blind our eyes to truth, and that is God. As an act of judgment. We see that. We see that in the case of Pharaoh in the Old Testament. He had hardened his heart so much. He had rejected truth so much that finally, in an act of judgment, God purposely hardened his heart to the point, blinded his eyes to the point that, that truth was not allowed to come in in an act of judgment. Now that is a very scary, scary place to be. That you are, you are so hardened in your sin that you, that you refuse to receive the message, the light of the gospel that God, in an act of judgment, hardens your heart. So we've seen the light the lamp is represented by spiritual eyes. You either have good eyes that, that openly receive the truth of God's Word, the message of the Gospel, or you have bad eyes. Bad eyes that have been darkened by sin, by Satan. Therefore, the truth of the message of the Gospel is not allowed to come in to your life. And then in verse 35-36, through 36, he gives us the lesson. The lesson. So we've seen the light, we've seen the lamp. Now in verses 35 through 36, we see the lesson. The lesson. Notice again, verse 35 Therefore be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. Whenever you see therefore, you know that it's always there for a reason, right? He says, Because of what I just said, be careful. Least the light in you be darkness. If your whole body is full of light, having no part, Dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp, when its rays give you light. So what is the lesson here? Light, just listen to me, light is not the issue. The issue is sight. We've got plenty of light. Again, remember, Jesus is the light. Here we are in the south. The light is so plentiful. You come to church. Church, do... 
do we ever really stop and just give thanks to God for how blessed we are that we can come freely to this church and we can study the truth of God's Word. We can hear it taught to us. We can hear it preached to us. You can go to Dothan. There's, there's what, two different bookstores in, in, in Dothan that have all kinds of material. You can get on the internet. The light, the truth is so available to all of us. So light is not the issue. The issue is sight, our spiritual eyes. Do we have eyes that are willing to receive the light? The psalmist in Psalm 119 verse 18 said, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. When we have the eyes of faith, this is beautiful. When when we have the eyes of faith, at that moment of conversion, when our eyes are open to the truth, you know, what, you know what the Bible tells us? We go from total blindness to total sight. God opens our eyes. And, and we see. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession. That is awesome. That we are a people for His own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. If you are saved this morning, in other words, if you know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are trusting in Him for your salvation. You're not trusting in anything else. Your eyes have been opened to truth. You have been called out of darkness. If you've ever been... I've heard people say... You know, I can't share my testimony because there's really not... You know, I don't have one of those testimonies that, you know, I was, I was drunk in a, in a bar and I was at the end of my life and then God just miraculously saved me. You know what? Today, if you are saved, you can stand and you can say, I once was in darkness, but I have been called out of darkness and I am now in the light. That's good. That's good news. And I just wonder, today... Do you remember? Do you remember when Jesus turned the lights on? Do you remember when all of a sudden his word it just began to make sense to you? I'm not saying do you remember when you just understood everything. You know what? As believers, we're all in the process of growing. I mean, I can pick up the the book of Ezekiel right now and read it and we'll all be confused. But do you remember? Do you remember when Jesus' light came bursting into your soul? And you know what? When that happens, it doesn't just affect a part of your life. It affects every area of your life. That's what he says here. He says, when you have, when you have eyes that are good eyes, the, the light, my message is allowed to come in you and it, it affects every area of your life. It doesn't just affect some areas, but it affects every area of your life. Do you remember when that happened? So how do we apply this today? Well, using what we learned last week and then using what we learned this week, there's two things. Number one, today we should be confirmed. If you know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, look back to the resurrection. That is the ultimate sign that confirms our faith. Yes, this life is difficult. We will have hardships. But you know, we can be of good cheer because He has overcome the world. And because He rose from the grave... And then roughly 40 days later, ascended back up into heaven, He went to go to prepare a place for us. So be confirmed today. If you know Christ Jesus, you you remember when the lights were turned on for you, be confirmed in your faith. But today I also believe that not only should we be confirmed, but perhaps we need to be confronted. Be confronted. By God's good grace, May this message today confront us. May it confront us. So we have to ask ourselves these tough questions. 
Is my life, is my life filled with light? Do I see evidence in my life that the light of Jesus is radiating out of my life? Because remember, remember if your eyes are, are receptive to the truth of, of Jesus and His message, it affects every area of your life. And so in your life, do you see that the light of Jesus is flowing from within you and outwardly? Or is your life filled with darkness? Or is it filled with darkness? Today, if, if your life, if you see very little evidence that the light of Jesus is flowing out of you, if you see very little evidence that the light of Christ is, is really uh, inside of you, there's, there's probably maybe one of two things that needs to happen. Number one, maybe you need to be saved. Let His light confront your sin. That was the problem, see? Remember, that was the problem with the Pharisees. That was the problem with the scribes. Is They did not want, they didn't like Jesus ultimately because Jesus confronted the very issue that they did not want to acknowledge and that was their sin. And so today, maybe, maybe the, the message of the Gospel is, is confronting you with your ultimate problem, and that is sin, and you need to be forgiven of sin. And His truth, the truth of His Word, reveals to us our problem. Yes, we're sinners. We're, 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 we, are, we are born into sin. From the moment of conception, that's what the Bible says. And sin affects every area of our life. And because we've sinned, and it only takes one sin to earn a debt against God that must be repaid, and we can't pay that sin debt back, but there is one who paid it for us, and His name is Jesus Christ. You can't pay it back. But He's provided the solution that can pay your sin debt, and that is Jesus Christ. And so the, the solution is not saying, okay, well, I'm going to say this little prayer. No, the, the solution is, is that you repent. That was the message that Jesus preached. That was the message that the, the apostles preached. Repent. In other words, you turn from your sin and you by faith embrace the Savior and you run to Jesus Christ and you say, Dear Lord Jesus, there is no hope for me apart from you saving my soul. You know, true repentance is not you just you just kind of do that one day, you check off the box, and you never think about it again because you got out of your you got the get out of free hell card, and now you're good, and you don't have anything to worry about. No, true repentance, true repentance is something that that is going to affect every day of our life. So every single day, you're you're reminded of your utter sinfulness before God, but you know you have a Savior who loves you and who has cleansed you of all your sin. And so today, if, if, there is no, if, if, if there's no evidence in your life that the light of Jesus is in your life, perhaps today, for the very first time, you need to acknowledge your need for salvation. You need to acknowledge your need for forgiveness. Or perhaps today you say, you know what, preacher, I know. I know that I'm trusting in Christ for my salvation. I'm not trusting in the fact that I'm a church member. I'm not trusting in my works. I know that I'm saved. His Spirit bears witness to me that I have been forgiven. And so you're a child of God. But perhaps today you're living like a child of darkness. Did you know that that is possible? You can be saved and live like you're lost for a season. But the Spirit of God has been confronting you with that issue. And He's not confronting you in the sin of, uh, of condemning you, but He's confronting you just like a loving father confronts their, their children who are living in disobedience. And so maybe today you're saved, but you're acting like you're lost because you have something in your life that's causing you to live in darkness. And, it, and it's, it's obstructing the truth of His Word from, from filling your life. And so today, maybe as a saved person, you need to acknowledge that area of disobedience to God and you need to say, Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me. Would you, would you, would you help me, Father, to live in obedience once again? Again, it's not so that we can regain our relationship with Him, but it's so that we can live in that full 
full uh, uh, fellowship that he desires as a father with his children. Because, you know, Jesus, we saw this last week, he reminded that hardened crowd that one day they would stand before him in judgment. You remember, he says, and on that day, the queen of Sheba will be there to condemn you and, and, the, and the citizens of, of um, Nineveh, they will rise up and condemn you because they, 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 when they heard the truth, they repented. But because of the hardness of your hearts, you refused to repent. And so, yes, yes, one day we will stand before Him and He will ask us on that day, you know what, on that day the only thing that's going to matter is what have we done with the light of Jesus? That's the only thing that is going to matter. I just want to close with the words of Jesus. In John chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus said to them, The light is among you, listen to this, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Well, let's pray. Father, Lord Jesus, Lord, we know that, that you are the light and that there is evidence of your light everywhere. But Lord, we know that you've given us a set of spiritual eyes. And the question is, is, is today, do we sit here today as ones who have eyes that are open to your truth? And your light is flowing into our lives and it's, it's, it's affecting every area of our lives and, and others see the light of Jesus coming out of us? Or today do we sit in darkness because our hearts have been hardened by sin and because of that sin, it's blocking the revealed truth of your word from coming into our lives? Dear Lord, may we be honest today. Lord, we know that the light is so prevalent today. But Lord, we know that one day, you're going to turn the lights out. And then it's going to be over. And Lord, we, we long for that day that we will stand before you. What a glorious day that will be. Lord, we know that the only thing that's going to matter on that day is what have we done with the light. So Lord, open the eyes of our hearts today. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray, I beg Holy Spirit, if anybody here today is outside of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we know that your word says that they're not one of your children. They're still a child of darkness. And I pray, oh Lord Jesus, would you open their eyes to their need, not for religion, not for church membership, not for baptism, but their need for repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Would you save somebody today? And dear Lord, for those of us who do know you as believers, Lord, we know that sin can be so deceptive. And just as the psalmist cried out to you, Oh Lord, search us and know us and reveal to us, dear Lord, if there is any wicked way within us. For Lord, we don't want anything to obstruct your truth from radiating every area of our life. Lord, we pray that your will would be done in this time of invitation. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,